Welcome to Playwright to Playwright, an online interview series presented by Queen's Theatre at Home. You are listening to the audio description pre-show notes for the interview. Because the format is fairly simple and the talking is continuous, there will be no audio description during the interview itself. The video begins with a title screen. The Queen's Theatre logo fills the left side of the screen. The logo resembles the letter Q. The circle of the Q is orange, and the rectangular tail is black. The text of the title screen reads Playwright to Playwright with Rob Urbanati and special guest Augusto Amador. Originally recorded February 26th, 2021. Technical production, Jay Rogers. The Queen's Theatre at Home text logo is in the lower right-hand corner of the frame throughout the interview. The word Queen's is in orange, and the word theatre is in black. The interview consists of close-ups of Augusto and Rob in large squares filling up a split screen, with Augusto on the left and Rob on the right. At times, when Augusto is speaking, a close-up of him fills the screen. Rob is in his 60s with close-cut, dark hair and a round face. Rob is in his living room and wears a black t-shirt with the Queen's Theatre logo on it. Augusto Amador is in his 40s. He has dark brown hair speckled with gray, a mustache, and a goatee. He is wearing a short-sleeved blue-and-white checkered shirt and square glasses with dark frames. He's in a room with white walls, with a window to his right, and a brown table to his left. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of Playwright to Playwright. My name is Rob Urbanati, and I'm director of new play development at Queen's Theatre. Today, I'll be speaking with Augusto Amador, whose play Atacama, the first play in QT's New American Voices Spring 2021 reading series, premiered last week. Augusto has a history with Queen's Theatre, beginning in 2011, when we presented a reading of his trenchant mother-daughter play, Soltarona. Augusto has written many character-driven political plays that I really like, and I'm excited to learn about all his upcoming projects. So let's begin. Hey, Augusto, how you doing? Fantastic, how you doing? Everything is fine here in New York. Where does this find you? So uh, normally I live in Los Angeles, uh, but you know, since the, since the epidemic, I relocated uh, to uh, outside Lake Tahoe area. So it's very, very lots of, lots of, lots of safe distancing and, uh, you know, it's, uh, and lots of nature. So it's, it's a good, it's a great, it's a great writing spot. Actually. Oh, nice. Are you going to go back to LA when the pandemic yeah. ends? Yeah. Great. Yeah, was, I mean, keeps getting. I mean, you know, the great thing about writing is, is that uh, whether you're playwright or you write for television, I mean, you know, it, it's it's basically all, it's all Zoom anyway. But um, yeah, I mean, I miss the city and I miss diversity and and all that. And, um, mm. It seems like a good time to be out of LA. So have fun over there <laughs> in Lake Tahoe. Um, yeah. I thought we'd start at the beginning, uh, which is to say, when did you start writing and what prompted you to write? Well, you know, so I come from, I was uh, born, raised in, born, uh, born and raised in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And to uh, my father's from Peru. He's a music composer. And my mother uh, was a chef, culinary chef, restaurateur. They both owned a restaurant together. So I kind of grew up with the culinary arts, with the... Um, with jazz, the classical, you know, so I kind of really grew up with that kind of, with those kind of influences. So it was, um, I decided to, um, and then I owned a, uh, <clears throat> I dabbled in the arts and then I opened a coffee house. Um, and then I kind of decided that that wasn't making me happy. So I decided to move to Los Angeles to, you know, pursue acting. So that was when I would say, I guess I'd say about, you know, in my late twenties or whatever, when I really started pursuing it. But, you know, it's one of those things where I just didn't, it wasn't my voice, you know, and I kept on trying to find my voice. And so um, I tried to get into to tele, to originally television and film writing, but still, you know, I wasn't finding my voice. And it was kind of, you know, writing my idea of what a film or, or, or a story is. And then I just decided uh, one day to move, just move to go to move to New York. And I just, I knew my sister there because so, she's already established. And so, but I didn't know anybody else. And I kind of, I wrote a play here and a, a, a novelist friend of mine says like, man, this is your voice. This is, this is where, and then if you want, you, you then once you get into playwriting, then you can uh, focus into TV and whatnot. But I think this, so I wrote a play and um, my very first play after being there for a month was, uh, was a workshop at Intar. So that was kind of cool, you know. And one of the first actors, uh, actually, one of the first actors in my very first play uh, was uh, Pedro Pascal. So that was cool. And then I was there, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, someone from the uh, the public theater 
came by to see that see, see that workshop in Tar. I really liked it, and then uh, I, I got an interview, and then uh, and then like I don't know, a couple weeks later, I, I was offered a fellowship at the Public Theater, which is crazy, right? And so I, I and from there, I just kind of went from there. Fantastic, yeah, and that's when I first became acquainted with your writing through the Public Theater's Emerging Writers Group. Was that a good mm -hmm. experience for you? Amazing experience. I mean, first of all, I mean, you get paid, you know, which, you know, to a playwright, you know, on TV, I mean, it's it's not like TV or film. I mean, you know, where you get paid for it if you're lucky. In theater, I mean, you know, it, it, you're basically writing for free in general. That's to, to me the big difference of it. And at the same time, I mean, that's why you have so much freedom in writing. But it was such a great, great experience. And, you know, we, I learned very quickly from the, from that experience is that when you're dealing with brilliant people, you know, you listen, you know, you listen to smart people. And really quickly, I really started embracing rewriting and which is the kind of, to me was the key to everything for me. And not everybody has that, been, not everyone's that fortunate to have, you know, people like at the public, you know, to mentor you. So, you know, it, to me, it was easy to listen, you know, as opposed to, you know, sometimes you can listen to the wrong, the wrong advice, the wrong, the, the wrong notes, but, yeah, it was really terrific. And a lot of writers that came out of there are really, you know, doing great work. You bet. I'm still friendly with some of them. Um, in fact, Don Wen um, was one of these playwright to playwright interviews. I think he was the year before you, if I'm not mistaken. But I want to yeah, go back so. to something you said earlier about finding your voice. So when did you find it and how did you find it? And I guess if it makes any sense to say, how did you know it was your voice when you you know, alighted upon it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, empathy is like a really strong thing. Um, but it was really one of those things where I, you know, I'm kind of like a survivor of a childhood trauma. And it was one of those things that coming out of it, I found all this empathy. I mean, if, if, if I was a superhero, I would have had like, empathy was my, my, super, my superpower. So I was really able to relate and, and just really tap into people's lives and, and kind of adapt it into my own thing and start telling these stories. So, you know, for me, it's, I get inspired by a voice, you know, and it starts, uh, they start talking and then I get to know them really well. And then I just throw them in a situation and raise up the stakes and they just start talking. And then, you know, in the first draft, it's kind of like, for me, in my process, it's, I'm like a court reporter, right? Just, just dictating, dictating everything. So, and so then that's my first draft. And then I go back to the second draft with my mind, you know, with a more of an editor's eye as an editor, and then start shaping it and whatnot. But I think in the beginning, it's really important to be to tap into that, I don't know, I mean, I don't want to sound like new agey, but you know, that ether, right? That kind of, that, that subtext, right? Um, and, 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 and specifically, I mean, for the most part, you know, so for example, if the scene's about love, I talk about everything but love. Every story has been regurgitated and told over and over and over. I mean, to me, what makes the story seem fresh again is the characters and the point of view. And I think we're really, and that's what I love about Queen's Theater, because, you know, you're one of those theaters that, you know, that represents its uh, uh, citizens, right? I mean, I think Queen's just has like the most language spoken per block. And the plays you produce are from different cultures and different people and different life experiences and and this and that and you know and so I to me I take that kind of in as a as a playwright that's the, that's the what I love about playwriting specifically is, is that you you can control the stories you want to tell and really you know and walk in those other shoes. I know when I'm I know when I got the when I when I got their voices when I, when I'm. <laughs> When I'm writing, and then like a couple hours later, I don't realize that I was I've been writing. Thank That's you awesome. for saying that about Queens Theater, and you know it's really true. There, it's the most diverse county or geographical area I think in the country, and there's some dispute over the number of languages that are spoken. People used to say yeah. 167, but I think there's a lot more than that. But it has mm -hmm. been what's been so satisfying about my job. Exactly what you identify is like finding voices that represent the community, giving those playwrights opportunities, yeah. and you know, turning our audience on to these, these different perspectives. And it keeps evolving. Uh, there's different communities, more diverse communities um, to be heard from. So 
yeah, it stayed fun and it stayed satisfying all these years. Now, the first play we did of yours was um, Solterona. Was that something you wrote at the uh, public theater in the Emerging Writers Group? No, no I wrote that before. Uh -huh. I wrote that. It was like a finalist for the MetLife National Latino Playwriting Award. Yeah, so then that was my second play. I love that play, and it was perfect for Queen's Theater because we have an intergenerational audience. It's diverse in that way too, and it's a you know a very um, intense mother daughter play. And it was perfect for our audiences. Do you remember anything about the reading at Queen's Theater of that play? I did. You know, I really loved. You know, I, I, it was the talk back with the audience was just really great. You know, and 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 even more so was like you know the 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 the, the coffees and cookies time. You know, it was really great to um, to just people have come up to you and, you know, there's like, you know, be like, I don't, so it was so diverse. I mean, like someone, I think someone was a older man, uh, Persian, and then you'd know, having a conversation about that and then talking to someone that was just, you know, a Caucasian person and uh, just different viewpoints. And it was great because they, it was great because they related to the experience, even though it wasn't the same culture, right? So I guess to ask, you know, answer one of your questions earlier, I guess, you know, I try to write to the human experience because a mother daughter, a mother daughter play is going to be, should be relatable to, let's that's that's say it's Latino, it should be relatable to if it's African American or Italian American or Persian American. Sure, the cultures are, they're different. I mean, you know, you write to those specifics, but, you know, the, I mean, humans are humans. And I think that's the, I think that's the key. Yeah, it's something that I think, I discovered along with our audiences, while there may be like a Venn diagram of ways in which things overlap, like you're identifying, and some themes of some plays become universal, uh, there's also something distinct that we learn about the different cultures from having writers from diverse backgrounds. So yeah, mother daughters, our audiences are all over these intergenerational plays. You've written other plays that have to do with mothers and daughters, am I wrong? Uh Fathers mostly, yeah, mostly, yeah, I guess, but I mean, really, it's the father's sons. I have another mother daughter piece, and then, but most of them are just about, uh, I have my dictator play trilogy, which at the comma is a third in that, the third of that, of that uh, trilogy, but really, it's about people. Most of my themes re reflect about people that are surviving through travesties, uh, travesties or tragedies or you know, trying to, uh, who are all of a sudden challenged by something and make a decision, either go left or right, and then kind of the consequences of, of such decisions. Let's talk about that dictator trilogy that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it, it grew out of an interest in history, but um, tell me more about that. Yeah, I mean, because I love historical fiction and I love, um, so my first play of that trilogy that's the play that I wrote from the public theater when my time was there. It's called Kissing Che. And it's the fictional rise and fall of uh, Havana's uh, last famous um, female impersonator. And so really it's the story, I would, kind of, I would kind of call it like Before Night Falls meets Kiss of the Spider Woman. And uh, that was actually a recent, recent uh, finalist for the uh, Carlo Anini Playwriting um, Award out of Italy, which they just they, uh, specialize in. Honoring um, LGBTQ uh, theme stories, but you know it's like you know, but the, you know, and that's the interesting. That's the when I talk about tapping into voices, it's interesting because you know I'm a straight man, but this character of this gay uh, uh, female impersonator really stuck, caught, caught in my mind, and I just started thinking it was just like really in my mind this uh, this main character Reina, and then all everything started revolving around that. So it was just kind of really inspired about persecution and it just kind of took a life on its own. Regarding the, the trilogy, did you decide you were going to write a trilogy up front or did the idea of a trilogy evolve after you wrote the first play? It actually it came to mind after I wrote the second one, you know, uh, which is, I wanted to write something about uh, just because a lot of people don't know about, you know, first of all, a lot of, you know what it was is that in uh, Cuba, a lot, a lot of people don't, a lot of Americans don't know about the persecution of uh, gay people that happened during, by the Castro regime that happened in the 60s and 70s, I guess in the 80s or not. 
And so I, after that one, I, I found a story about Trujillo and uh, from the Dominican Republic. And then it became a father and son piece and then it kind of spun to that story. So it was like a father and son story with the backdrop of uh, the the uh, Dominican Republic, uh, uh, and it was Afro, and it's an Afro Latino piece, you know, which is sadly enough not seen enough, not seen enough on American stage. Um, and that was a father son story, and so that kind of just spun out too. So, and then finally, the Atacama, uh, I have advice from a friend of mine, actually, for uh, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, uh, a friend of mine, really great director Victor Mayog, said you should write a two hander. I was like, two hander, that's that's tough, right? And it is kind of tough, you know, but in a lot of ways, it uh, band is so intimate. I mean, you know, it, writing a two-hander is about as intimate you can get, I think, as a writer, because you have nowhere else to go. So you can't throw these characters in that, that kind of character in or another different kind of situation. It's just you and the other person, what you're saying. And so, uh, but yeah, it's just really about, you know, it's just really about, especially now, well, especially now, Whoever thought I'd be, you know, writing a, you know, dictator play trilogy in this in the State of the Union today, you know, it's like in the backyard almost. But yeah, yeah, but it's unfortunately. very unfortunately, right? So we're going to be doing a virtual reading of Atacama. Um, in fact, I think by the time this interview airs, we will have done that. I know that you've had the taping, uh, the recording session for that. How's that, how did everything go? Oh, ex excellent, excellent. Jay was really great before the, the IT stuff. And yeah, my actors, uh, uh, Jose Febus and Socorro Santiago are really terrific. And it's so much fun working with veteran, accomplished actors like that, you know, because they really have that, they really bring a lot of gravitas to the silence, you know. Uh, and my director, Sarah Guerrero, uh, really outstanding and I've been working with her. I really try to work with Latina directors because you know there's so many great ones and you know and, and, and they don't they do not nearly work as uh, enough. So I've been really kind of fortunate to have Sarah to work with on and direct my plays because she really has great vision and uh, we're kind of a great team. So that, that that's a it makes it a lot easier. Let's put it that way. But it went great. I, I really had a great time with it. And I think the actors are really terrific. And I think it's going to be a real, I think it's going to be a real fun, um, uh, 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 what do you call it, streaming event. Tell me about virtual readings. So since the pandemic, since your time in Lake Tahoe, um, I'm guessing you've been involved with some and also seen yeah. some. What are your thoughts? Tough. I mean, it's, I think it's really tough, toughest on the director and the actors because you can't, you know, it's not like it's, it's not like a, shooting a, a movie or a TV show where the actors are actually in the room, right, acting off each other and vibing off each other, whatnot. You know, you, these, these two actors are in two different rooms. I mean, you're basically an actor almost acting off a green screen, right? So it's, so it's, it's, it's frustrating in the sense because, you know, everyone's kind of, I think in a way, Frustrated because you, you're almost right there, but you can only get go so far when it's when you don't have someone in the room. Doesn't mean it can't be excellent performances and real and all that, but I think really to take it to that level, it's got to be live, you know, you know, or at least act it up with someone, someone that's like a living, breathing person, you know, right next to you. Uh, but they've been all, they've been all. I mean, overall, all the experiences have been I mean, great, and and the the. the Thankfully, because you know my director uh, and actors are being really terrific, it's been all really good experiences. But you know, it's it's like everybody else. I think it's tough for everybody else because it's nothing. You know, ain't nothing like the real thing, right? Do you think it'll continue, or vir the idea of virtual readings, virtual programming, will continue once the pandemic subsides? I do because I don't think there's going to be a lot of theaters left. <laughs> you know, this is cheap. You know, and it's uh, it's a way. I mean, on the plus side, right, is is that I got a lot more viewership, and I think a lot of people are, are seeing a lot new, new playwrights because they have access to it to watch it. And not only that, to you know, uh, it doesn't have to be on that night. You know, they can maybe watch it a little bit, you know, a couple of nights later. So I think that that, in a lot of ways, that's great exposure for the playwright. But I, I think I think it's here to stay because I mean, honestly, geez, man, I, I can't imagine. I, I, 
I mean, probably the people, the, you know, the BIPOC theaters is probably going to be like 75% gone, you know? So I think that because of it's going to be, it, it, because of a lack of uh, finances, I think that, that virtual meetings are here to stay, you know, but, but not for the right, not for the reasons that it should really. Yeah, I see what you mean. It'll be interesting to see what happens this year and into next year regarding virtual programming. So right. do you have a play, uh, the book of Leonides, am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, Leonides. That takes place in Queens. Right. I'm wondering where it takes place in Queens and why it takes place in Queens. I kind of had it set up just because, um, so the story is about, it takes place in the present day, but the story is about this, um, about this uh, uh, Afro-Dominican uh, character who's um, selling Lucy's on the same block that his father used to be a, a um, used to be a, a, a crime lord in the 1970s. So he's kind of like this shadow of his father. And, you know, in the meantime, he's got these dreams of becoming this, uh, uh, he, uh, this comic book artist, right? Graphic novelist. I kind of said in Queens, but just because historically speaking, there were a lot, I guess, I'm not going to do research, but it, uh, more research on that, but uh, um, was where people escaped after the, the, the Dominican Republic. And so I kind of parked it there. But also, too, I, you know, there's not a lot of place uh, that's set in Queens. So I thought that was kind of like more interesting and that kind of business. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fascinated to see that. Do you do, do you stipulate where in Queens, like what neighborhood in Queens? No, I had a, I just had it in a in my mind. I did, but not really specific, specific. Yeah. I'm just curious about that. Now, um, I wanted to talk about film and television because you've been involved with both, and I'm wondering what your experiences have been and how it differs from playwriting, and whether you um, plan to continue to do all three. Well, yeah, TV right now is my Kind of be my focus right now. I have a play that, or play, play, play. Uh, I have a pilot uh, that's uh, been optioned and in development now for a first look at this major streamer. So, you know, so, so, um, so that's really been my focus in getting staffed and whatnot. But actually, writing for TV is kind of like it's actually helped my playwriting because it's, you know, in writing a play, you you know, you can have a the first scene could be like fifty pages, right? Just straight fifty pages. And in in television, you don't have that kind of real estate on the page, right? So it has to be a lot of it has to be about it's every 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 uh, line is precious, right? And so it's really been about you coming in early and leave, you know coming in uh, 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 late and leaving early on those scenes. Um, but television today, it's, it's you know television's character. You know, it's characters and, you know, who, who else knows more about characters than a playwright? So that's kind of really been fascinating, you know, and um, and especially television. There's so many great shows now that are created by playwrights um, that um, can really tell a real definitive, unique story, you know, um, now. So I think it's slowly opening up more to BIPOC and unfortunately not enough Latino centric shows. But it kind of it's um, going back and playwriting. I noticed that now when I write plays, it's kind of like not more to the point, but I just I just find I get to it faster, you know. Do you find you're able to sustain or extend your voice, the voice that you said you found in playwriting when you're writing for television? Yeah, because I think it's the same approach, really. You know, it's just you're saying it in one and a half pages instead of you know fifteen. <laughs> or two pages or three pages but no i think especially i think especially it's it, um it's uh it definitely comes into um playwriting definitely comes into my training and my experience has definitely come into um uh especially tv writing because it's about characters and from that viewpoint um but you know it's it's in tv there's a lot more collaboration a lot more so it's not but even as you know, as a playwright, you know, you have that time by yourself, and you create the and you, and you create what you have to say, right? But the real change of it happens in in the workshop of it, right? And the, which is collaboration, right? Which is working with dramaturg. So you got to open yourself up to to listening, 
to me, it's really important to listen to actors that because they're the because a I've been really fortunate of having a, a lot of amazing actors, so they're really smart. And so, like I said, I listen to smart people, but also too, they know, you know, they study that character that they're playing so intensely. You know, I think it's foolish not to say, hey, do you think that that uh, your your character needs some of this, needs something more or something less, or needs to say something or whatnot? I don't always take it the, the advice, but. You know, I think it's really important. It's foolish not to listen to that. So, but a lot of that, you know, and then of course, you know, previews and all that, and listening to the audience, how they react to it, and and whatnot. You, you know, that really helps when you go into the TV realm because, man, it's man, there's a lot of rewrites, notes, and you know, we. I mean, the pod that I have now, where it's like I don't know, 15 rewrites now. Wow. Um, you know, which is pretty intense. But I'm so used to it; it's not an issue for me. I don't find I don't find it's issue, and it's. It's helped me be able to uh, rewrite very quickly and turn it back. Because you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a playwright writes, not, you're not writing for, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but when you're a playwright, you don't write for the money. <laughs> right? This is true. You do not write for the money. You write because you have something to say. And theater is one of those few things left that will give you the pretty much, I mean, you don't fire the playwright. You fire the, you know. You know, you, you fire the director or the set, you know, you fire everybody, the actor, but you don't fire the playwright. So, so that being said, it's, a, that's, that being said, I think that's a lot of um, power to have as a creator. But at the same time, like I said, at the same time is, is that to me being a generous, crea a, a, being a very generous creator is, is the smart and, you know, uh, um, I think that's the professional and smart thing to do, you know, because that, at the end of the day, I mean, it's it's the end of the day. It's 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 everybody else that helps make it really successful, and, and it deepens it. I'm really glad to hear that. Just that you get that kind of satisfaction from writing for these different mediums. I noticed you've been involved in a lot of developmental organizations, and you were talking earlier about collaboration and listening to other people. How has being involved in those types of fellowships and developmental processes? Um, work for you? Is it satisfying? Is it um, disappointing? Is it complicated? What do you oh, you know, yeah. So I, 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 all three for sure. Um, because you know, I'm, it's not like you know when you're writing by yourself. You know, you can have you can go the gauntlets of emotions, whatever, but you're by yourself, so you don't have to really worry about offending anybody or uh, uh, making someone happy or watching what you say or whatnot. But you know, when you're in the development programs, you, you realize that it's a collaboration. So you, you know what you're getting into when you walk in the door. And so, um, but you learn how to, you learn how to, this is that to me, it's really where you learn how to make it truly successful and to take it to the next level. Um, and I really mean that, you know, of course it's your words and which what you put on the page, but it's also, you know, that's it's not like, you know, like David Mamet has a really interesting point of view of what he thinks about actors and whatnot, I don't know, which I don't agree with, you know, uh, even though he's an amazing writer. Uh, you, you know, it goes to the page and then in, this, in a sense, a lot of ways, it's the director's show, you know? Um, and especially with TV, it's like, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's the actors and, and everybody else involved. So I think when, for me, to, it, all that stuff I learned from the fellowships has really helped me in my writing in the sense of, in the sense of uh, um, second and third, fourth drafts, whatnot. Um, and of course, you know, the great thing about fellowships is, is the networking, you know, is meeting people and, um, you know, to, to know your work and, you know, because you know, theater is like, like, te like, like television theater is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a popularity contest, you know, you know, there's politics. So, um, but I think they're really invaluable to, to, to really get your voice out. It's really great to hear. I know for some writers, it's not as satisfying as you're describing it, but I think your you know, sure. interest in collaboration and listening to people makes these um, processes worthwhile. And I'm also really glad that you've been so busy and productive. Uh, you mentioned this um, uh, pilot of yours that's been optioned. Are you working on any new plays, Augusto? I well that the well the minus is is that it's kind of taken away from my playwriting a little bit, but I have some ideas and things I want to sketch out and talk about. You know, it's just very, you know, it's just I, 
it, it's kind of poisonous in your mind because you kind of like wonder, well, why should I write another play? Because it's going to be, because the scene's going to be kind of messed up for a while, right? It's going to give me a lot of not theaters coming back. There's going to be a, probably a whole log jam of plays that are not going to be able to get, they'll never be produced anymore because there's it just, there's just not enough space. So it's kind of like retraining my mind to write a new play now, you know, uh, unlike for TV where, you know, there's no, again, no money, you know what, but you're doing it to really do it. So uh, uh, it's kind of like retraining my mind to go back to that, you know, writing because I really have something to say specifically. And so um, I'm kind of like working my way into that. Into yeah, that that's most playwrights are, most theater artists are figuring out you know what it means like what the future means for all of us and what's the best use of our time but you know uh we're moving forward things are you know progressing and so hopefully we'll all get a clearer sense soon of um you know what the future portends i'm so glad augusto that you know we had a chance to do your work way back when with the uh, uh emerging writers group at the public theater um, yeah. We were involved with that and that now we have another chance during the pandemic yeah. to see yeah. a virtual reading of this, you know, brilliant and powerful and harrowing play, Atacama. So thank you for um, bringing your work to Queen's audiences and thank you for oh, talking with me today. I really appreciate it. You have fascinating perspectives on um, everything, on being thanks. a writer, on the developmental process, on um, finding your voice, the individual voice. So um, yeah. I'm happy for you. I look forward oh, to so future work from you. Um, oh, thank you. And um, I wish you the best. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I really hope your, I think your audience will really love this piece. I think it's like really right up their alley, so. I do too, I do too. It's fantastic. Thank uh, you. Thanks so much and take care awesome. and have fun you in Lake Tahoe. Oh, you lucky oh, yeah. guy. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Augusto. And thanks to all of you for watching this episode of Playwright to Playwright. We'll be back with a new interview on Tuesday, April 20th. Until then, please keep up with all Queen's Theatre at Home programming on social media by subscribing to our YouTube channel or on our website at www.queenstheatre.org. I'm Rob Urbanati. So until next time, thanks a lot.